Today's speaker is uh, Professor Goran Senjanovic. Um, he did his uh, bachelor's studies in Belgrade, Yugoslavia at that time, and then his PhD at uh, the City University of New York in the United States. And he worked at Brookhaven uh, National Lab and uh, briefly at the University of Zagreb. And then he moved to uh, the International Center for Theoretical Physics um, in Trieste, Italy. He founded a group for phenomenology of elementary particles at ICDP, and his speciality or his field of work is um, theoretical physics of ele elementary particles. Uh, he's uh, well known for his work on neutrinos. He proposed the seesaw mechanism of neutrino mass, and he did a pioneering work on left right symmetry models. He's co author of over 100 papers, um, many, many citations over 11,000, uh, 11, and uh, today he's going to tell us about the uh, neutrino paradigm and what we can learn about the neutrino paradigm uh, from experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm an old friend of the Institute. I've been here many times. Gave a number of talks. Now, it turns out that I gave a colloquium here 20 years ago I wonder if there are some of you there. Some of you should have been there. I spoke of neutrinos. Neutrinos were supposed to play a great role in cosmology. They don't do that as much as we hoped. I'll try to argue that neutrinos surprisingly play a great, great role at LHC. And at LHC, this machine that I'm sure all of you heard should find the Higgs particle, right? This God's particle, as they call it, can actually be a machine uh, to probe the nature of neutrinos and the origin of neutrino mass. Now the title here, it's not my title. I was ordered last summer to give a special colloquium at CERN. They said use this title, okay? And I've been using it ever since. I'm not sure it's the right title. But I've noticed, I've been preaching this for a while and, and uh, there has been a change in the last couple of years. People are more and more willing to Listen, that LAC is not just machine to find the Higgs and so-called extra dimensions and black holes. So let's, let's start. Now, the, um, today we have a standard model. I hope you have all heard of that. A theory of all the particle interactions, elementary particle interactions, that is based on symmetries. I won't talk so much about these symmetries. They are local gauge symmetries, whatever that means. When I say all the interactions, I mean all the interactions by gravity, simply because gravity is negligible by many, many orders of magnitude when we talk about the world of elementary particles. So you may ask, <coughs> why in the world does gravity matter then? Why does matter gravitate? And the answer, again, I'm sure, I, sh I hope at least the first five, 10 transparencies, you all know what I'm talking about. Well, because the celestial object have many, many elementary particles. And having zero charge, gravitation becomes the main pause. But I can safely ignore gravitation when I speak of the micro world. And that's what I do for the rest of my talk. The theme, as I said, the title that I gave you, the true title, has to do with the left-right symmetry. It's the first symmetry that a child sees, right? It's the symmetry of the images in the mirror. And I want to tell you that this could be a fundamental symmetry in nature, and that the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, could test that. Now, <coughs> elementary particles have their characteristics. As all of us, they have mass, they have charge, or they may not have charge, and they have spin, right? Just like her, they keep spinning. They have what is an angular momentum at rest. And in quantum mechanics, spin is <coughs> an integer <coughs> times the original fundamental spin of a half. That's the only thing we really have to know about the spin in this talk. And the particularly interesting objects are the particles that have spin one half, the basic entities of matter. Now you all know that, let's say on this uh, transparency, you all know that the world is made out of atoms, which is made out of nucleus and electrons going around. And then you all know that nucleus is made out of protons and neutrons. They have spin one half. We call them fermions. Protons are positively charged, neutrons are neutral, the name tells you. 
I want you to remember I have this funny unit, okay? We, we use crazy unit in particle physics. When I write GeV, just remember, that's the mass of proton and neutron, a very tiny mass. And of course, electron, which is basically massless, some 2,000 times lighter than the... Uh... Now, in 1928, Dirac writes an equation, a quantum mechanical, if you wish, a Schrodinger type equation for fast moving particles and find that the spin is in build. It was one of the magical things that emerged of his work. Now also you all know that protons and neutrons are made out of aces, right? Invented by Zweig in 1964 in the series of paper and worked out in a gory detail. You all know that they are made out of aces? So the proton is supposed to be made out of two up aces, one down ace. They're actually colorful objects. They come in different colors. Neutron will be a little different, two down, one up. And of course, something's got to keep these guys together. We'll talk about it. This is, this is, these are the messengers. Every force has its own messenger. In the case of quarks, there will be objects, which we call gluons. They glue them together. And as we speak, they keep gluing us together. You all know they are made out of aces? Actually, it shows you that if you don't do the original work, you better choose an original name. So I'm sure all of you heard that they are made out of quarks. It's interesting, Gelman didn't take them seriously. The idea that there are quarks, and he abandoned it immediately. So I kept pursuing it, and he never even got the Nobel Prize for that, which is maybe the most important work in, in modern particle physics to us. Now, these are not the heroes of our talk. <coughs> there is electron. Proton and neutron, the hero will be neutrino, the lightest of all elementary particles. Here is no charge. It's a mysterious object that keeps bombarding us as we speak, coming from the sun and wherever else from. And uh, as I was saying, you know, the, the thing about particle physics to us is that the interactions have these messengers. This was a photon. You just saw a little movie about how an electron interacts with another electron. It simply emits the photon, as you have seen, as a messenger of electromagnetic force. And the other electron receives it, and therefore that's why they will scatter and not just pass by each other. <clears throat> what we do, you see, this is a picture I showed you before, right? That's the electron. This is precisely what we saw the, before <clears throat> in, a, in an interesting paper, which was impossible to read in 1948. In, an up, in the appendix, Feynman develops a set of rules to tell you not only how to depict these processes, okay? This is what I've showed you in a little movie, right? The electron comes in, it's moving in this direction, it stays an electron, emits a photon that the other guy does, and the most important rule of Feynman ways of understanding this was is the cornerstone of modern particle physics. You should never do what I've done here. It was too late to correct it. You cannot break the fermionic light. If you do, that would be a source of new profound physics, okay? So please, it, it can't, an electron moving in this direction would be a, a positron, an oppositely charged particle moving in the other direction, okay? So it can serve as a nice message. Don't break this line as I did. So when I tell you that we know the forces today, that we have a consistent theory, we know all the messengers of these forces, we know their properties, okay? There is the photon, a messenger of electromagnetic force, there are Gluons, remember the guys that are gluing us together, the quarks inside us. There are eight of them, it turns out. They are similar to a photon. They are supposed to be massless. And then there are, these are the heroes, together with neutrinos of our story, what we call weak gauge bosons responsible for radiative decays. Charged, two of them, W plus, W minus, and the neutron one. And they're very heavy. Remember, this was a proton mass, some hundred times heavier than the... Uh, and the proton mass. Now I think we can argue, I'm sure most of my colleagues would agree, that the modern particle physics starts with a bombshell of Dirac. Three years after he wrote his equation, <clears throat> Dirac shows that, Dirac actually shows, Dirac takes courage to say what was immediately clear to him and everybody else, that there must be antiparticle. And this is an amazing thing, it came out of blue. He writes an equation that describes an electron. And it predicts that it must be a positron, an oppositely charged particle with all the other same properties. There is a little drama behind this. It's worth telling. 
because actually they were seen even before. In 1923, Skobeltsin in Russia says he sees the particles which are like electron, but they move in the opposite direction in the magnetic field. He sees them from cosmic rays. When we get photons, they annihilate into them. It's even more interesting, the story, because in 1929, a graduate student at Caltech, Chao, actually tells everybody that he sings them. He's, he's being hushed down among many people, including his senior colleague Anderson, who, when the Dirac says that they're antiparticles, quickly repeats the work of Chao. This guy even got a Nobel Prize. OK, this is amazing. So maybe there is a little message for younger people. You know, don't, don't be scared. If, they tell you that what you're seeing is not there. I don't know if I have a message for professors who steal from the <laughs> students that I think we can't teach them. Anyway, this is well known. You can read about it in Wikipedia. It's a contesting Nobel Prize. Anyway, as the time went on, eventually there will be an antiproton discovery. It will take some time. And then one after another, for every particle, we found an antiparticle. And this is probably the most beautiful thing one could argue our field. There is a, for every fermion, what I call spin one half particle, a different antiparticle from a particle. It's beautiful, came out of blue, except they may not be true, says Majorana. He says that neutrino, that will be our hero, and it carries no charge, could be its own antiparticle. Okay? Ettore Majorana. We'll write this paper. It's the last paper before his tragic disappearance. I have to say a few words about him. He needed a job. He wouldn't publish. He needed a job. He was getting a job in Napoli. And they said, if you want to get a job, you have to write a paper. So he takes out of a drawer one of the classical, or maybe most important papers in our field. And on March 26, 1938, he disappears. He's not even 32 years old. I gave a colloquium last week. This was more for people in the field. It was on March 26. I've been fascinating by Miranda. I find it very nice. At Grand Sasso Laboratory, I spoke on the day when he disappeared. He took a boat from Palermo to Napoli and was never seen afterwards. And the legend grew because the body was not found out. And if you're intrigued by, if you know anything about him, there is a beautiful novel for those who live French. A slightly uncertain destination by Anne Marie Cambon, Une Destination La Jamon Uncertain. And it's what is surprising, she's a, she's a lay, lay, lay woman. It's a beautiful, even physics correctly described, beautiful novel. Now, this is sort of a search for Majorana, it was never seen who saw Majorana. I want to tell you. It's interesting what Fermi says about Majorana. There are various types of scientists, he says, second, third rank, do their best, don't go far. He meant of uh, many of us. Then we have first rank. They make great discovery, fundamental for development of science, he said. And he's actually, this is, this is sort of a little crazy, maybe. He puts Einstein there with the Bohr, Heisenberg. And then he says there are geniuses like Galileo and Newton, right? They surely we all agree that Newton was one of the greatest geniuses. He puts Majorana in that category. He says he lacked common sense. He wouldn't publish. And I like to say this, you know, these days the way we publish, I wish we had lacked some common sense. Um, so now, by setting the stage, I'm taken to the theme number two, which is going to be interwoven with the first one. I want to understand the origin of the symmetry. I told you the first symmetry we see. And uh, my run of work will take me to a beautiful subject, which sort of means that I can create electrons out of nothing. I'll be precise about that. It's called neutrino. It's double beta decay. It's a technical language, which is today textbook. And I want to show you that this is immediately after my run. We are talking about 37, 38. Some 50 years later or so, we came up with the suggestion that this can be seen on the colliders. And I want to convince you that there you can actually probe inside the heart of the matter of my run and nature of particles. Much better than at low energies, OK? Now, why are they so special neutrinos? And it's sort of funny to are they are special because they don't like to interact with anybody. They're the most aloof particles you can imagine. And sort of you say, well, why do you care about them? Well. 
if they are so aloof, they can be probe of new physics because where there is zero, a tiny effect can be very important. So just to remind you, hopefully you heard of this, or to tell you, how were neutrinos discovered? Actually, they were invented theoretically by Pauli in 1930 in so-called beta decay, the neutron, who is a slightly heavier than the proton and the electron together, it can decay. In particle physics, more or less, you should remember that whenever you're allowed to decay, you do. So if I'm heavier than you, I'm going to decay into you. If not, we will learn that there is some deep new physics, OK? So what was strange that there was no conservation of energy, and even some people are willing to give it up. He said, why not imagine that there is a new particle? He actually called it neutron because there was no neutron at that time. And the name would be changed to neutrino, a little neutron, by Amaldi, who suggests to Fermi, who is the father of neutrino physics by and large. And it's a kind of brother of electron. They're always supposed to exist together, be detected together. So this is what I've seen in those days. Right, if neutron decays into a proton of electron, and this is happening in some nuclei, heavy nuclei, they don't move. So electrons should take some fixed energy, right? The energy should be the line, the difference between the energies of the father and daughter nucleus. And instead, what they saw was a continuous spectrum. And it sort of would be the most natural thing to suggest, well, let's share the energy is being shared with another particle. But it's interesting, okay, I, I have to mention this, that a Pauli who suggests that this is a letter that he writes to the colleagues in a meeting on radioactivity, that he calls it a desperate remedy. He's very apologetic. He's introducing one new particle and he wants to be forgiven. As I speak, Someone is sending a paper in my field to our archive suggesting at least five new particles and telling that it is the simplest possible extension of the standard picture. So maybe they were too conservative, but I could call this good old days. You will see there will be good old days and there will be more than times in my talk. And it's interesting, he can't be in the meeting because he has a dance. Okay, I like that. It's good that he wrote this letter, right? Because the rest is history. Now, how would this particle be seen? It was very scary in the beginning. How to imagine that you could see it? Because the way you would see it, to see it in the inverse process, if I get it in the decay, I should then, to see that exist, do the inverse process, right? I hit a proton, and then I'll get a neutron and a positron, right? Proton has a positive charge. Positron has a positive charge. Charge is conserved in physical processes. The thing is that this guy doesn't want to interact with anybody. The mean free pass, the distance the neutrino travels before he wants to interact with you and me is 10 to the 20 centimeters, right? It's, it's amazing. And I think this helps understand John Updike, a great American writer. I hope you know John Updike, many of you. He's been nominating many times for a Nobel Prize. He died. And he wrote this poem. Now you can read it. There is no reason that I read for you. Notice, he can't stand that it goes through you and me. They enter in Nepal and pierce the lover and his girlfriend. He says, you call it wonderful, I call it crass. Well, this is maybe where a poet differs from, from a physicist. It's another interesting thing. He knows they have no mass. By the way, they do have mass, and it's not because there are no referees for poets. Any referee would have led this being published. This was 1960s. <laughs> when I started out my research, I believe Neutrino has a mass for reasons I'll tell you later, okay? My friends were very worried. My wife was worried, said, look, even a poet knows <laughs> that neutrinos are massless. You know, what are you getting yourself into? So why did they finally see the neutrinos? It took 26 years. It's a field that requires patience, okay? That the thing, you will see it always takes 10, 20 years for whatever new ideas that appear. So 26 years later, Cohen and Rhinus will see neutrino finally. Why? Because in reactors, this is Savannah River reactor, you produce a lot of them, right? So if you produce a lot of them, eventually you see a few events. Look, the number is huge. Per every second and square centimeters, we get 10 to the 13. 
Now, these are good old days, I think, for those of you. Well, I don't know. I have my experimental colleagues here who are on little bigger teams, you will see later. They probably told you enough. This detector, you know, what you do, your water is the best source of protons, so you just fill your detector with water. It was small enough, but only the skinniest member of the collaboration could fit in. There were two physicists and six technicians. What <coughs> will emerge and what will be important for us that there must be a messenger, we said, for every force, right? So if there is a photon for a magnetic force, I need a messenger similar to a photon we call the W boson, weak boson. Who makes this process happen? Neutron emits this messenger, becomes a proton, and then finally I get this final state. Um, so you see, this is the way it works, okay? Let me give you a little illustration. When I say that neutron decays, I really mean that the aces decay, or quarks, as we typically call them. They are inside these particles, okay? They are elementarily. So I have a neutron with these quarks decaying into proton. And the way it does, you see, there was this down quark that will become an up quark by emitting a W boson. It's a little simplified picture of what goes on and producing this final state. Now, for the main theme of my talk, this is the second grain bombshell of particle physics. And this could also be argued one of the central steps in the development of particle physics, is when these two young guys, this is how they looked when they got the Nobel Prize, okay? They were like less than 30, I think, did he leave? It was really a bombshell because everybody believed for that time that left-right symmetry had to be a good symmetry in nature. So when they come with a suggestion that parity, this parity I will call the left-right symmetry, is actually broken in weak interaction in this process that produces neutrinos, and it was turned out experimentally to be true, the world got very excited. What it meant that in these processes only left-handed particles would interact, as if I would only with my left arm participate in that. This is what they taught us. Uh, they actually had a dream. This is very interesting. Most people don't know this. It's, it's to the extent was forgotten by them for a while. That in the last quarter of the paper, they actually suggest that deep down at the fundamental level, they cannot believe that the symmetry is broken. It has to be broken from logically. But how can it be that this symmetry, the first symmetry you see, it's not a fundamental symmetry in nature. You'll see, it's, it's, I'm going to call it Lee and Young dream. So these are good old days. There were five people on the experiment. And it's always stressed. She's called Madame Wu. There was a woman running the experiment. She wasn't sure of her result. So she asked colleagues to check it. This could be a reason why she didn't get a Nobel Prize, because this is an extraordinary thing, right? What happened is in the process of the neutron decay of the nucleus cobalt decay properly polarized with the spin, defining a direction. You can do that with the spin of the particle, okay? What they've seen, the electrons wanted to go down and not symmetrically, if I define left and right, not symmetrically going up and down. Most of them, actually what they've seen is all of them would go only down. So what it means that this messenger, while it's parity, strongly, and it wants to interact only with the left-handed part of us, or the left-handed part of elementary particles like electron and up and down quark. It took some time to, for them to be recovered. These are more than time, there are 137 people. This is interesting, this is alpha to the minus one. This is for my colleagues in the field, right? An interesting number on this. These are 80s now. The machine's a little bigger. I'll show it in a second, okay, just a, a sketch of that. It's a now seven kilometer circumference machine. And the reason that they needed a bigger machine, you needed to accelerate to higher energies, and for this you just need more of running. Okay, because these guys weigh about 100 times more than the proton. So uh, we will learn about them, a new machine will be built, LEP, electron positron collider, that's now it's gonna be really huge, okay? These are modern times. We got 1,500 people with four detectors, 27 kilometer circumference. And you're gonna produce a billion of these guys, okay? 
So we are going to learn about that. This is why I tell you that we have this standard theory understood in gory detail. Now they are, as you can see, uh, what is it, 16 euros you can buy it for. This is just a sketch. I'll show you a picture later. This will be the new big machine. This is how the old one look at that, which is the injector for the for the big one. Now, what is the Majorana program? Okay, let's come to the crux of the subject we are asking. He says neutrino could be an anti-neutrino. I mean, just in this in case of Dirac, which was an extraordinary simple equation, relativistic quantum mechanical equation, turned out to have a rich, deep physics behind. The same thing happens in case of Majorana. If this is true, what he says, he can write a mass term. The neutrino is now allowed to have a mass. Even if it's purely left-handed, this would completely contradict for Dirac Nu. And I can't explain this technicality here to, to you. But the bottom line is, it would mean, you see, that I could have sort of two neutrinos disappear or being created. And since they are bodies or brothers of electron, the same thing will happen to the electron, if Majorana is right. And it will happen like this. I hope you can see these are our Feynman diagrams. We describe everything through Feynman diagrams. Remember, they just tell us what happens in the process. This is a beta decay. This is a beta decay. When a neutron becomes a proton by emitting a W boson, gives me an electron and the neutrino. Sometimes it can't happen because the daughter nucleus is heavier than the father one. Germanium is lighter than arsenic, therefore it can't decay. In 1935, as you have written here, Maria Gepet Mai realizes you could have a double beta decay in there because selenium is lighter than germanium. In this case, I can actually have a very rare process simultaneously two of these guys. It takes a long time for this to happen. It's not a subject of my talk, but it's probably the longest, no, it must be the longest lifetime ever measured. It takes about 10 to the 20 years for this to happen. Now, what we did, what Majorana tells us, he breaks the rule that Feynman told us and that I broke by mistake. You can never break this fermionic line unless you have a Majorana-like particle which has to be neutral. So if this is possible, then I can break this line and now we get a process, you see, which I'm getting electrons, which I call them electrons out of nothing. I have only nuclei that are producing electrons without this being obscured by neutrinos, which is the missing energy. And that can happen, of course, only if this guy has a mass. It came through my random mass. So now I can have a neutrino less double beta decay I, I called before this, this ugly technical language. We should introduce a better name. It's a simultaneous decay of two neutrons. You see, each time a down quark becomes an up quark, as you see in this little movie. The shiny guys are W bosons, which are then producing anti-neutrinos. And they can simply annihilate, if you wish, figuratively speaking. They've been looked for desperately now for a long time. These are modern times. This is the experiment they just started. There are a number of them. This is a great time in this kind of physics. We usually, in our field of elementary particle physics, have to wait for decades, often for new experiments. Now, all of a sudden, we are going to have a series of, this is, look at this guy, right? The detector is now a little bigger. In a few years, they are going to tell us what is going on, and we are coming to the point of being able to test our theories. These are really modern times. Look at this futuristic picture of the situation uh, of a Gerda detector. Um, so what is the standard model? Okay, here is a telegraphic summary of a great prediction of the standard model, great but wrong. Standard model invented by Glesho Weinberg and Salam, my ex-director who died prematurely, unfortunately, from Parkinson. These people developed the theory, and what was crucial in the theory, something that I myself found extremely annoying, it bugged me from the first day. What's interesting, they started to bug Salam. 
And this is the way the standard model looks. I'm, not sure, I'm sure you won't understand it if you don't do physics. You don't have to. I want you to pay attention that it's completely left-right asymmetric, painfully so. Whereas in the left-handed sector, okay, particles have their left and right natures, the way we have left and right parts of our body. The left-handed guys, they have to live together, neutrino and electron. The poor guy here is alone because there is no right-handed neutrino. Well, it's true, we have not seen this guy. But they write the theory saying it will never be seen, okay? And therefore, the Majorana mass term cannot be written, you see, because this guy has to live with the electron. So if I write the Majorana mass term, I would have to write the electron mass term. But the electron carries charge, so I would have a violation of charge, okay? Here I have sort of an annihilation of two neutrinos. So they predicted the neutrino is massless, okay? People already suspected that the neutrino is massless. It's one of these strange dogmas, you know. People find that the number is small and they decide. These days, very often, most of my colleagues teach their students. Sometimes I even heard myself say that, that the photon should be massless. You see, we never seen a photon having a mass. It's very dangerous to make this statement, right? In, in physics, in science, there are no zeros. We should keep probing. So neutrino was supposed to be massless. And, and the question, why is the world asymmetric? Well, I could stand this. Okay, actually, this is courtesy of Micha, Micha found this Leonardo da Vinci. I think this kind of asymmetry I could live with. It would bug me if we had an invalid here completely, and I, I like to say that, if you allow me, I, I can believe that God may be left-handed. She can't be an invalid. She just can't believe that. I mean, they are telling you in the standard model that the world is like that. It's just asymmetric, and it will always be. Now, suppose that you want to have a symmetric world. The way you would do it would be simply sort of um, just do it, let's say, Nike's approach. Just make it symmetric. Take the guts and say that the world is symmetric. And this is what they suggested, but they didn't work it out. They said that you probably won't do Pati and Salam. And then we showed Mohapatra and myself immediately afterwards that actually it could be true that you could have this asymmetric, uh, that the world could be completely symmetric, which would mean that there must be, if I believe in this kind of picture, that there must be a new gauge boson. Whenever there is left, there is right. So there must be another messenger. Why didn't I see it? Well, that's obvious. I mean, that's now trivial to say, because it's heavy, so you didn't see it. That's what you say at the beginning. But if you were to reach these energies, then, of course, you would see the symmetric world. And the way I imagine it is really imagine that the world is symmetric in the following sense. Suppose that you run into a situation like this. Okay, this is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. If I see a, things like this, I would say that the symmetry is broken, right? There is no symmetry between left and right. But that, of course, can emerge from a completely symmetric situation because a world like this cannot exist. This point is unstable, right? You don't want to live in a local maximum, right? You're going to fall down left or right. And where you can fall down, it's a completely free situation. Once you fall down, you are breaking the symmetry. So what we imagine that the symmetry is spontaneously broken. And it can be worked out, and that will lead to a number of consequences that made this so-called left-right symmetric theories. Now, there was a curse. The theory had a curse. Because the neutrino, you see, I said to you that the world had to be left and right symmetric. Therefore, the neutrino is not very similar to the electron. So it ought to be massive. But every, everybody knew that it was massless, and the limits were telling us that the mass was small. So this was a curse that will turn into a blessing. When we realized, it took some time. It's amazing how these little things take time. How often you're in the dark when you're trying to develop a new theory. It took us years to understand that I can't describe this technically, but what happens is that the right-handed neutrino can by itself get my runner mass, and it does get in in this theory, just the way he envisioned. 
I don't need to put left and right together. I can have a completely broken world in the end. And so there is this heavy guy that somehow being in contact with a tiny neutrino that we know and love gives it a little mass. It's called the seesaw mechanism. One of the people that contributed to this was Gelman again. He's good with names. He's been all his life very good with names. Okay? He didn't even write the paper. He didn't take it seriously. He just said a few lines in there. But the name caught up. I wish I had chosen a name like this. Okay. Gelman got himself on this just by calling it CISO. People like the name. What turns out that, that this is I won't be describing here. That we knew that it had to be heavy. It took many years to settle the issues of how heavy. It's been going on the study of this, but we knew already in the early 80s that this guy, remember, this is a mass of the proton, this unit. The W boson that we found at SPS and lab weighed about 100 times more than the proton. Now I'm in a completely different ballpark. And therefore, I myself for many years stopped really working on this seriously. I had to give up on the possibility of seeing it because we knew it had to be very heavy. These numbers changed a little bit uh, last year. We revisited and settled the issues, okay? And what I can describe here is the series of phenomenological reasons that indicate that it could be a, a, an upper limit. For people in the field, I'm willing to discuss later. Uh, this is work mostly done with Micha and Fabrizio Nesti, my student, Elo. So now there is a finally, see this is again, we've been dreaming about this in the early 80s, finally, actually started in the 70s. Finally, now there is a chance that we could see it in a machine, okay? So we have to find this big guy, the big dog. Now, meanwhile, what emerged, this is a subject in itself. The neutrinos do have a mass, okay? It was found in a mine in Japan, in a deep mine, Kamioka, in a beautiful experiment that was looking for a completely different matter. It's called proton decay and subject in itself. It turned out that they proved the neutrino has a very, very tiny mass. Notice orders of magnitude nine at least, orders of magnitude, at least billion times lighter than the proton. And the reason that you now need, this is the, remember the first detector when the skinniest person could be inside? Now this is the <laughs> super Kamiokande detector. You know, you have to go with a boat to check your photo tubes. Bottom line. We know that neutrino is massive. Now, if neutrino has a Majorana mass, remember, there must be a process that I depicted through Feynman diagram. A neutrino is double beta decay, this emergence of electrons. If there is left, there is right, that we notice immediately with Mohapatra. Therefore, there will be a completely analogous situation. Now, here, this process is rare because neutrino is very light. This one is rare because WR is heavier, but they become competitive. So what we did, we took it, now that LAC is coming, we took seriously this possibility. Again with Micha, my student Ned Tello, they did a lot of work on this. And others, we took it seriously that this may be the new physics behind neutrinos double beta decay. And wanted to see what is the connection with the LAC. Well, in, after all, how can this, we are talking about nucleus decay, be related to a machine that probes physics at the energies of thousands of proton masses? And the answer is, the, was given already 30 years ago. You see, 30 years we have to wait for the ideas to be probed in this field. What we suggested is just a rotation in a plane. So take this diagram, okay, and rotate it. Instead of neutron and proton, please think of quarks. So when I rotate it, I will finally have this form. I've done it a little different. Why? Because inside protons, this was the, remember, the picture I got after rotation. The same diagram before. These are these two electrons coming out. Okay, these are my quarks oriented. What happens is a machine at LAC, the, um, these quarks and antiquarks, they live inside my proton. So when I hit a proton on a proton in this large hadron collider, this is what this machine is all about, I'm sure. Your colleagues here told you about that. You would produce, at these energies, the analog of the W boson 
exactly the same way that they did it in the old days. Except there is a profound difference where here before there was a neutrino and that's just would be the energy they don't see. For them, light particles don't exist basically. It's a missing energy and they're so light. Here you produce a heavy particle. Remember because of the spectacular nature of it being a Majorana state, it could give us the two electrons. We call them leptons, light particles, okay? I should have stressed this name for electrons and his bodies. So see, if this is true, if this exists, and this is what is being searched for, what you would see if you find this guy, you would see parity restoration, the world would become left right symmetric. You would also see lepton number violation, what we call the violation of the electron number, the, the, the production directly, and uh, not only indirectly, but more than that. You could actually see this beautiful thing, what Majorana imagined before he tragically disappeared. And that is that there are particles who are sort of hybrids. They cannot decide whether they are particles or antiparticles. They're both. I said it's half time it's a particle, half time it's an antiparticle. So many decays, it's half of the time it decays into an electron, half time into a positron, okay? So maybe for my colleagues at LHC, sort of to appreciate the extraordinary thing, you would actually look deep down into the nature of particles never seen before. And this is the only direct way that you could see this physical process. So this is the Large Hadron Collider, right? These are more than times. You've seen this, I'm sure, the people here, you have a great group here. Um, see, this was the little thing that found the W boson originally, okay, today is an ejector. It's kind of amazing, but I think maybe, uh, I don't know, for some reason, uh, I come from Split, actually. There are groups in Split and Zagreb here, Zagreb and Didas. There are two major Detectors, ATLAS and CMS. We have a Croatian group which is strong in CMS and we have an ATLAS group, I think, predominantly here, right? They can tell you a lot about what they are doing. I want to convince them that, that they remember themselves if those, it's the right time to jump on it. There is a historic opportunity to see uh, into the core of the particle physics standard model. Now, this is how the uh, one of the detectors looks like, right? These are modern times. There are a lot of people on the experiment. Look at the size of the detector. Now, I want to tell you, I'm not going to give you the names of people that are dedicated groups, both at CMS and Atlas, that are searching for what I've been describing here. This is finally becoming reality. I, am, I'm, I hope I showed some of the enthusiasm and the excitement that I have for me personally after waiting for such a long time. And what is great that we had already data, LAC is doing much better than we anticipated. So there are a number of papers that CMS and Atlas have produced. And now what is beautiful, okay, we are finally doing real-time physics, okay? Those of you that do your daily real-time science may not appreciate what it means to us. You see, remember that I told you that the limit was around this number? There was a theoretical limit that we could come up with. Is finally the experiment is catching up. And just a few days ago, it was last week, I think it was right a week ago on Tuesday, there was a new paper by Atlas that has discuss this, so please stay tuned. I hope that in the near future we can convince you that what I told you here is that LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, can actually probe the origin of neutrino mass directly and not indirectly, okay? This is the reason I find very excited as a particle theorist, someone who loves and studies these elementary particles, the only way to see into their future is these big machines. Whatever the impact is, the cost and the struggle to build them, the only really direct way to see inside of nature is that and not the low energy processes. What is great, what I want to tell you is that we are talking about the same time scale. I told you about nuclear physics experiments. They are going at the same time scale. We are talking between three to 10 years. 
So it's a great time that we can now have on different ends experiments probing the same phenomena. There is at the same time cosmology playing an important role of neutrino mass. I didn't talk about it here. That's a subject in itself. And what I want to argue that wanted to argue that the mystery of left right symmetry could be resolved. Thank you. Isn't it so that uh, although you claim that there is left right symmetry with neutrinos, right is different than left? So. Uh, That's for sure. That's what. Um, remember. Okay, you, you have a probably another, maybe you, you are driving it. Remember what we said, there was, I'm glad now you asked me this. There was Li and Yang who argued that left and right symmetries must be broken and finally it was confirmed in the experiments. What we saw up to now was left only. By the way, I should have mentioned this. They were sure that the world had to be symmetric. Now I, uh, I did my work in New York. I was in New York, and then I worked in Brookhaven National Laboratory, which was mentioned before. T.D. Lee was at Columbia University, which was very close. We were in the same city before. In the summer, he would come to Brookhaven, and he was extremely discouraging of my work. By that time, left won. They got a Nobel Prize. They didn't want to talk about their dream. Okay. When I worked at Brookhaven, C.N. Young, the other guy, was a colleague in Stony Brook. We were like sister institutions, almost like here at university. And they, and they was also discouraging me all the time. Now, about 10 years ago, T.D. Lee changed his mind. Now he's sure that the world is symmetric. We have to go to higher energy. He wants all of China to look for it. So I had to give a summary talk in his conference a few years ago. He was very happy that I reminded the world how they had this vision of the symmetry. He was less happy when I reminded them that he was discouraging me, you know. I, I was telling him, you know, where were you when I needed it, when I was doing my career? And people were telling me I was wasting my time. Remember, we came up with a prediction of neutrino mass. True, left is different from right, but if I come to high energies, I won't care. They will become so similar, right? Once I look from above, the fact that W boson weighs a lot, if I go to very high energies, to me, photon is not so different from the Z boson, which is neutral. At very, very high energies, there will be almost no difference, little difference in, in, in couplings. But they will look very similar to us, right? After all, what is a small mass? There is no small mass. It means that the mass is small compared to energy. Dimensionful numbers are not small. Remember that. What is small is a dimensionless number. So I always mean mass over energy when I speak of an object being heavy or light. And that's why we needed this big machine. Are there any other questions? Svetlana. You mentioned that for you, uh, crucial experiment is to see uh, four same sign leptons, right? Right. But, Two uh, electrons. Since or... uh, this is a, a collision of quark and anti-quark from proton, you must have a very strong background in, in this, uh, this process, right? So. Uh, you probably have estimation of the background from glue glue that since that's the dominant contribution at LHC. I was gonna show you the picture. The background the background goes to zero when you go to very high energies. Uh, we are gonna precisely goes to zero. If you go to energies about about fifteen hundred GeV, remember we have to be above twenty five hundred GeV. Basically, the background goes to energy. When you look at the same sign, what you call same sign leptons for people in different fields, just two electrons, the background effectively goes to zero. This is the reason why we could see this. The background, you're worried about the things that can come from top quark, whatever it is, okay? The higher the energy of your particles, right, the, the more unlikely that you are accidentally producing the thing from the... Uh, thing that you have in the standard model processes which look like this. Remember, the standard model process doesn't exist, right? But there could be some missing energy. I, uh, I'll have to show you. I'm confused, but I cannot. If I say here, I don't see what I see there. And I would like a computer expert to help me. Can you understand why I cannot see this? I just see the... Uh... If there is another question, I, I'll be happy. I want to show to Svetlana. Is there I, have a nice, I have a nice plot showing this, okay, which I was afraid it will be too technical, but okay. It's... 
But if I may, I would have please. another question. Please. Uh, a very naive one. Is there, I mean, uh, speaking about uh, left and right handed neutrinos in this uh, um, context, is there any, I mean, what is the implication for possible leptogenesis of, or if no, maybe differently, for the, uh, what is the impact of this to the asymmetry between mat matter and antimatter? You're saying that these particles are particle, antiparticle blind in some sense. So is there any relation to the symmetry with... Well, uh, sure. Yes, General. I think Micha found it. Um, well, it's a question that requires some explanation of what you mean. Um, particle physics, more than particle physics, came with the following possibility. I have then to answer your question, I have to say a few words, right? The universe we live in, let's see how many of you know this, I hope you know. It's basically empty, right? It's full of radiation, cosmic microwave background radiation, and almost no matter. It's only that this matter matters a lot, because whatever little there is dominates the energy contact of the universe. And an interesting thing what you see in the universe, before I finish it, let's just show it to, to Svetlana. This is the courtesy of Fabrizio Nesti, my collaborator. This is the background, which you call. For those of you which are not familiar with this, okay? This will be coming the number of ends as a function of energy. You see, this is a function of energy. This is in these funny units of GV. I'm going to a very large number here. I can go even to a larger number. These peaks would correspond to seeing the mass of WR. For colleagues in the field, this is this bright Wigner resonance. Okay, this is the way you would see it. You see this particle, it sort of peaks in your production number of events. All of a sudden, where the number of events were small, when you come to the mass, you get a huge jump. Notice that red is going to zero when you go to high energies. This is why even a small number of events could be, could be meaningful. For any sign. Actually, for any sign, by the way, this is true. Mika is right. This is actually true for any sign. We are particularly keen of the same sign because we want to see lepton number violation, which has to do with Peter's question. But uh, so see, it was huge at these energies, and then it slowly goes down. This is why the studies that were performed, there were detailed studies performed some 10 years ago by Ferrari et al. This was the Atlas group. Turned out that we can see the, this WR boson, surprisingly, even to 6,000 GeV. If we reach this machine, it's going to double its energy very soon. It's going to have 14,000 GeV energy. And when the so-called luminosity, your ability to accumulate events grows, we will be even to see the go all the way to 6,000, OK? Which is what I wanted to argue is the scale where we hope, where we expect it even for phonological reasons to be below. Now, your question is a tough question. We live in the world in which no matter how far you look around yourself, there is no antimatter. There are no these antiparticles. And to many people, it's very surprising. Why in the world, since the particle physics is symmetric and there are electrons and positrons, how come when I look around me, I don't see this antimatter, right? It starts by knowing that Micha is not, no, I know he's matter, not antimatter. We survived this. And then you go on and uh, study the sun and study the galaxy and you go beyond. And it's been very surprising. And particle physics came up with the explanation of that, which is a little, it scares me a little bit. I worked on that and it still scares me. It's actually called genesis. And the name tells you that there is sort of a worrisome detail. You're sort of probing the energy of the existence of the universe. It turns out, however, that you have models based on the lepton number violation, based on the violation of electron number. You see, if your theory violates the symmetry between particle and antiparticle, then it becomes a dynamical question whether I have more particles or antiparticle. If that symmetry would not be violated, then the initial number would be a God-given number. But here is a dynamical question. The trouble is that, that, that I can at best show you that my model is consistent with the possibility that genesis took place. But there is no way of verifying this mechanism of genesis. I'd like to talk about it if you're interested. We have come up after 30 or more years 
Well, what I believe now, I'm sometimes worried, it's almost a metaphysical issue and not a scientific one, that we discuss things that cannot be probed at all. I think we are not being fair to our colleagues in other fields. And this is completely ignored. The best we can hope that my model agrees with the world in which there is no antimatter, but I will have no way of probing it. Not the mechanism, not the dynamics. So if you want to know in this theory, if you're asking me, can I produce genesis? At this, at this uh, scale, at this energy, the answer would be no. Which should mean that this is not the final theory of nature, and I would be the last person to tell you that, right? As, 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 as finally LAC is there becoming a reality, the so-called final theory, I, I don't know if you've been familiar, we, in particle physics, we learned, we lived through some dark ages when my colleagues would speak of a final theory, okay? Which is scientific populism to me, and not science. A final theory of all the phenomena. It's coming for so-called strings, that is, we're gonna explain everything. That you wanted to know, not only about particle physics, but biology and whatnot. Which presumably will even tell you why biology and why chemistry is chiral, right? Why life is chiral, why the symmetry is not broken. But I don't even know what that means, okay? And, and it would be nice to discuss if, if, if you care. It's very, very, very popular these days to use it as a, the claim is that LAC is gonna probe into that. It's a terrible, unfair, and wrong claim. But it's being perpetuated, uh, so I... We have one more question. So left right models predicts a bunch of Higgs bosons. Uh, what is current phenomenological study on this? Can LHC probe some of this stuff? Yeah, sure. Well, I didn't want to, you know, it becomes a technical issue. It, it is a standard model as it's terribly ugly, I, I'm scared sometimes. I have my nightmares that the standard model may be correct. It's a dream of, of most of my colleagues, but you know, one man's dream, someone said, is another man's nightmare. Mine is that the standard model is correct because someone else said, I'm not sure, I think it was Berlioz, that one of the greatest tragedies of science is this terrible fact that many beautiful theories are killed by ugly facts of nature. I'm scared that my theory, <laughs> our theory, what we've been working on may be killed by ugly effects of nature and the standard model. You know, there is this you know, theory which you have a crippled, completely world to imagine that it could be true. The beauty of the standard model, I want to emphasize, it's an extraordinarily simple predictive theory which has this one Higgs particle with the properties well understood, well under control. That's the beauty. And this may finally win the simplicity in spite of this ingenuity may be true. The thing for those of people who search for new phenomena, yes, the theory has offers a lot of interesting Higgses. For example, the doubly charged particle whose signatures are spectacular, and there are dedicated groups at LHC, independently even of the theory we are developing, okay? We've been in contact. We have now in the strict, uh, uh, with Miha and others, with the CMS group, which are providing them details of what is happening. These doubly charged guys would be really spectacular because it would decay into a pair of electrons by itself. So this is all under study. But that would, of course, make it maybe too technical. I was just hoping for the people in other fields to get a basic picture. I mean, we are not having questions from our colleagues who are not particle physicists. Couldn't have been that clear. Well, or that confusing, I hope. I have a very simple I and mean, short question. Just when you when you discussed uh, compare the the reach of the LHC compared to what you call theoretical uh, bounds on the WR mass, uh, if I understand correctly, that is actually it's again it's an experimental bound. It's just indirect experimental constraints on W. It's not purely theoretical, right? The, uh when you, when Sorry, you, which one? I'm, I'm the sure. 2.5 TeV. Uh, 2.5 TeV. <coughs> when you uh, said that the, the LHC is closing on to the theoretical uh, bounds. Where I, did I put it? I would think this is still uh, experimental, but just indirect, right? From flavor and, yeah, this, this thing. Thera what do you call theoretical limit? The... Um, 
this is now, this is not my talk. <laughs> this is a more particle physics version of my talk with the details. What the NR is alluding to is the limits of 20, precise number 2500 GeV that I said LAC is coming to. They're actually doing this, this would be a true limit. They're looking at, and technically it would be digets, not depending on the nature of neutrinos, not depending on the anything, okay? And the number that is, for if, if right-handed neutrinos were light, it would be missing energy. The number was already produced with the luminosity of five uh, inverse femton barn. It's 2.5. Right, it would be. So the, actually we are today in a situation where they are about to publish this. Sure, sure, sure. I'm, I'm more concerned about this statement that this is a theoretical limit. I think oh, it's right. still That's an experimental right. limit. It's just indirect experimental. Right. right, right. No, this is very good. The reason I didn't want to talk about it here because the experiment caught up. This is a very good point. This indirect limit, by the way, is a true limit in the minimal theory. All I said here was done in the minimal theory, right? If I want to tell you what the predictions are, I have to be in the minimal model. The beautiful thing about the experiment is that it's going beyond the minimal theory, right? And it's becoming a, and that's why I didn't even want to talk about it here. Even when I give now technical talks, I've stopped talking about it. We did a lot of work here. You can say why in the world, right? Maybe if he had been more wise and more patient, but theoretical physics are, you know, it's hard to be patient. And it's hard to be wise, right? So. Uh, well, it's good to know. You see, we are telling people that we need 14 TeV. It's sort of nice also to tell people you're not going to see it now. This was a lower limit. You are going to come at best to the thing, okay? In order to see the other process, you'll very, very likely, we were telling before, need 14 TeV. It's good to know that you didn't make false promises. So in that sense, maybe the analysis was useful. Okay. Um. If there are no more questions, let's thank Professor Senjanovic for an instructive talk. Thank you.